So recall that with the exponential growth, uh, we ended up having a function that looked like this. Okay, so exponential growth. Uh, exponential decay would be when I start out with some amount and it reduces. So exponential decay would look like this. Okay, not pretty straightforward that with it with regards to that. Not more complicated than that. We can get significantly more complicated, but we want to focus on these two situations. Exponential growth, pink. Exponential decay, orange. So here's some talk about exponential decay. We use it in science all the time. And the model looks the same. So recall, for exponential growth, we had y equals c, which was my starting amount, times a, which was the base of my exponential function, or my power but it's also called the growth factor when I'm talking about exponential growth. And then I had some independent variable, oftentimes it's time, but we can just say generally it's x. And my resulting amount after the such growth is y. With exponential decay, I have the exact same thing, except it looks exactly like this, with the exception that a is now called the decay factor And how do I determine if it's exponential growth or exponential decay? Well, decay is when a is less than 1 and greater than 0. For exponential growth, it's when, for growth, it's when, why did I put an e on the end of that? I would never know. And I have to still fix that h. For growth, it's when a is greater than 1. And we're not going to have a an a cannot equal 0, and a cannot equal 1, or it's useless. Uh, not interesting is the phrase I would prefer to use, I guess. It's not interesting because then it's just a line. We've talked about this in class previously. And a is, uh, it can be less than 0, but in our situation it's not going to be, at least not frequently. Okay, so oftentimes we use it for radioactive isotopes. So in this particular example they're going to be talking about is the decay of iodine-131. So iodine-131 is an, a radioactive isotope, and it's, it's going to decay over time or lose its radiation, uh, amount of radiation, because it's not, it's not stable, okay? And... We, as we might know from science classes, things that are unstable want to get to a stable situation, typically. Uh, so for instance, water's stable state at this pressure, sea level, is to be water, and it will be the temperature that the environment is. Um, disregarding the sun, heating it up, and cold wind, you know, winds cooling it down, et cetera, et cetera, and the ground temperature, blah, blah, blah. If you just had a glass of water, it would be room temperature, right? Uh, if you boiled water and then put it in that same glass or cup so it won't shatter, um, it will want to go back to that steady state in the temperature and it would want to be liquid instead of steam. If you filled a room with steam, that steam would condense on the cooler items because it wants to return to that state based on what the environment is. But anyway, that's simplifying it quite a bit. I'm sure your science teacher would rip me apart. Anyway. So iodine-131 is an unstable isotope, and it wants to become a stable isotope. So what it does is it gives off some of its, uh, I, don't, I can't recall whether it's what it's actually giving off, but it's going uh, to it's going to decay. Uh, and here they state, every eight days the amount of iodine-131 remaining is cut in half. So recall from exponential growth, we had doubling time. And we often modeled that with uh, a base of 2. And the example we had was like the folding of the paper, right? 0 0.1 times 0 0.2. Uh, what did I see? I used T and the book used P, right? That was our function. So the thickness of the paper was based on what we started out with. This was the starting thickness. It happened to be 0.1 in the example. And this is going to double each time we fold the piece of paper. With half-life, that's what we're talking about here, the decay of iodine-131, half-life is eight days. So again, like doubling time, I'm talking about time itself. When I say half-life, I'm talking about the time it takes for the isotope to reduce to half of its previous mass. 
Um, so this would be half-life, and in this particular example, it would be, or this discussion is eight days. So in eight days, it would be half. So let's go through just kind of a brief example. We have a table down here as well. So if I started out with um, 320 milligrams of iodine, I don't know what iodine's, uh, I don't want to look it up either, iodine 131. Uh, and eight days later, I'm going to have 160 milligrams of iodine-131, okay? So if we look at the table they've built out, they started out with exactly 160. So at time zero, at time zero, we had 160 milligrams, okay? So that would be day zero. And at day one, we now have, I'm sorry, not day one, time period one, we have 80 milligrams. So we know that after time period one, we have half the amount, so that means one time period is equal to eight days. So when they say point two, two time periods, two Ts, I have 40 milligrams left. They're talking about 16 days after I started. Eight days after one, but 16 days after zero. Three would be another eight, so that's 24 days, and I have 20 milligrams after three days. I'm sorry, three time periods, or, or 24 days. And after four, I'll have, uh, what, eight, 32 days after four time periods, I only have 10 milligrams. Now notice, I will never get to zero because I'm just cutting in half each time, right? I'm just cutting in half each time. I'm never gonna get to zero. There's always gonna be some amount left. And that's how we can carbon date things with uh, carbon 14. We can determine what how old something is by, looking at, by doing carbon dating and looking at carbon 14 as an isotope and its half-life. So as I said, the function is quite the same output, initial quantity, decay factor, or growth factor if we're talking about exponential growth, and the input, that time period, T. And so, as I said, A, our base is gonna be between zero and one. Our C is gonna be greater than zero, meaning it's gonna be above, it's not gonna be some negative amount, because how could you have the negative amount of something? Uh, and so, A is called the decay factor, and that box you'll have to probably know. So if you wanna hit pause and take notes on that, or look in your textbook and take notes probably still need to pause. So here's an example that I already showed you the answer. Hopefully you don't scrub back. So how would you model decay of 500 milligrams of iodine-131? So since we know that we can do the following, we can have some starting amount, but A is one half, and T is um, the amount of time periods. We could register it this way, time periods, and so we were starting out with 500 milligrams, so we could say 500, one half T, and s clearly state that T is equal to one, which is eight days. So when T is equal to one, that's eight days, or one, one T is equal to eight days is another way to write that out, okay? And so how would you model it that way? And now how many milligrams would be left after four time periods? This is example one, that's A, and B is how many milligrams would be left after four time periods are 32 days. So we would go Y equals 500 times one half to the four because 32 divided by eight equals four time periods, right? So once we put that in our calculator, that would look like this, uh, 500 times one half raised to the four. And so I get 31.2. So 31.25 is how much I would have after four time periods, okay? And let's see what the book did for us. 31.25 after 32 days and our model looks the same. They just use Q and T instead of I used Y and I think T, right? Yeah. 
and we could have used Y and X, and you could use any, any letters that you desired. Example two, and my crinkled scan. Here we go. So you can follow along in your book. That's tough to read. Example two. Example two is identify the initial value and the decay factor for the function. Okay, so I have n equals 3 times 10 to the 4 times 0 0.25 to the t. So n is however much I have when I'm done. So that's my dependent variable. t is my independent variable. We don't know what it's, it, it represents. We could assume it's time since it's t, but I don't know. Now the initial amount, our initial amount, we usually label it with a C, or starting amount if you prefer, is equal to 3 times 10 to the fourth, or what is that, 30,000 I do believe. And our decay factor, A, which is our decay factor, is equal to 0.25, or you could write it as a quarter if you wish, okay? And they give us those same answers below. So for each t, for each t, whatever t is, we're going to keep 25% of our previous amount. Example 3. So example 3. Which of the, uh, which of the following exponential functions represent growth and which represent decay. Identify the growth or decay factor. So remember, growth is when a is greater than one, and decay is when a is less than one but greater than zero. So how do we do that? A, so a is the following function, p of t equals 2,000. You can just see it on the left of your screen, 1.05 to the t. Since this is a, and a is greater than 1, then, a rep then part a represents um, exponential growth. Okay? b, I'm not going to write down the function this time. We'll just look over to the left here on the screen. q of t equals 25 times 0.75. So my a is equal to 0 0.75. Since a is less than 1 and greater than 0, then this represents exponential decay. C, n, equal, n of t equals 16 times 2 thirds to the t. So our a value, our factor, is equal to 2 thirds. And since a is less than 1 and greater than 0, then this is exponential decay. And let me guess, without looking, you don't know that I'm not looking, d is probably going to be growth, so they have 2 of 1 and 2 of the other. And it's a trick, though. Okay, so here's a trick. If I have this function, f of x equals 5 times 4 to the negative x, yes, a definitely looks like it's greater than 1, right? Because it's 4, right? a equals 4, which a is greater than 1. But take a look at this up here, this negative sign. If we think about exponential rules, let's rewrite this part of it, just that part, and let's just take a look at that. 4 to the negative x. But isn't that the same as 4 to the negative 1 times x? And 4 to the negative 1 x. Aren't those two things the same? If I take x and multiply times negative 1, isn't that the, isn't that the shortcut that I'm supposed to do to take care of this? So I'm kind of going backwards. I'm taking this and turning it into this more complicated looking thing, right? Now, that means, what's 4 to the negative 1? Well, 4 to the negative 1 is actually 1 fourth to the x. So one thing we need to make sure that we do is this exponent must always be positive for us to determine if we're exponential decay or growth. So once I make sure that that's positive by doing this little trick, by taking and going backwards with my shortcut rules so I can absorb this negative 1 into, my, into the base or my factor, I find that my factor is actually 1 fourth, which means a is equal to 1 fourth, which means a is less than 1 and greater than 0. So we have exponential decay. Okay? And we'll scroll up and see what the book has to say, since I didn't write it. And look at that. 
and they tell us that d, that's the tricky one, is actually decay because we can rewrite the function as with a growth, excuse me, a decay factor of one fourth. All right. So example four, I assume. Oh no, we're going to go talk about half life. Okay. So we've talked about half life already. Um, the half life of iodine 131 is eight days. Uh, if I t t yeah, let's not even just do that. Okay, each year the dance association holds a dance marathon. This is example four, where 256 dancers perform solos. Example four. After each 25-minute round of dancing, the judges eliminate half of the participants. So 25 minutes, half gone. Okay? Uh, how many rounds would it take before there is a winner? How long would it take? Okay, so let's... First, we want to think about the model, but maybe we can make a little table first. So at time zero, how many dancers do we have? Well, we have 256 dancers, right? At time one, or one period, you could say 25 minutes if you'd like, but it gets complicated when I do that. The math does. But if I say time one, time period one, so let's say that this is T and this is big D, number of dancers, t is time, where time is equal to, one time is equal to 25 minutes, okay? So then, building up my table, one, I would have half of the dancers gone after 25 minutes, so now I have 100 and, what is that, one, 128? I should know those numbers. <laughs> it's doofy me, sorry. So one, 128, two, after two 25-minute periods, or two Ts, I'm going to have um, half of this again, so that's 64, okay? Let's keep building this out, and you'll see. After three of these time periods, so three times 25, that's 75 minutes later, I'm going to have 32 left. Four, I'm going to have 16 left. And these are... Now, these are individual dancers. We're not talking about pairs or anything like that. Five... I'll have eight, six, I'll have four, seven, I'll have two, and after eight 25 minute periods, I'll have one left. So I'll have to go through eight 25 minute periods. I believe that's how we'd count those answers up. Because once I'd have to go the full eight and then eliminate the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so how long would, it would take eight rounds. How long would this take? Well, we have to take eight times 25 minutes. So that's going to be, what, 200 minutes, right? And if you wanted to, you could divide that by 60 and figure out how many hours there are. But um, it doesn't ask for that, and that wouldn't be all painful. And so there's the model they built. 256, we started out with half, and then T, and T is just the 25, how many 25-minute periods? And so there's our, for one dancer, if they want to do it algebraically, one, we can uh, guess and check now. In chapter six, we're going to learn how to use logarithms to solve this, but we can use a table to find the answer, which we've done. And so we get to eight. So it takes eight rounds to get this done. And so we want to talk, ha talk about half-life. Let's do this and get the next example going here. When we talk about half-life, the half-life in exponentially decaying quantity is the time required for the quantity to be reduced by half. Okay, which we already discussed a couple, three times already. Okay, so example five, using a graph to estimate the half-life of an exponential function. Radionuclides, nu radio nucle no, it's nuclides, hmm. are radioactive substances. Please stop laughing at me. Often used in medical procedures since they have a relatively short half-life. I assume that's like barium and whatnot, right? I don't know. Uh, so the amount of radioactivity in the body diminishes rapidly. Yeah, I think barium is an isotope, and they use it for uh, gastrointestinal uh, stuff. But you guys are the nurses, so you could slap me around and tell me I'm wrong. So bone scans routinely require patients to receive an injection containing TC99M radionuclides uh, that will briefly concentrate in the patient's bones and then show up in a gamma camera image or scanner. So figure below is a graph showing the decay of TC99M over time, T, in hours. So each T in this case is an hour. From the graph, estimate the half-life of the radioactivity level of TC 
99M. Check your estimate using the internet. So it wants us to look this up, half-life of this. We could, and we'll see what we ha if we're going to need to get there. So let's say that at 10, we're going to use the graph to estimate. So at 10, it looks like maybe I have this much. Maybe I don't want to do it that way. Hmm. Okay, and we're talking about MBQs, whatever the hell that is. Uh, is defined as the activity of a quantity of radioactive material in which one nucleus decays per second. Um, hmm. So at time zero, we have 50. So how, how long does it take for us to get 20? Oh, they've done this for us. At time zero, it's 50. At, time, at 25, what time is it? It's, it looks like maybe it's time six. I'd say maybe six. So um, taking a look at the graph, maybe six, five and a half, something like that. So at time zero, I have 50. And at time five and a half, let's say, I have 25. So 5.5, uh, maybe it's six, I don't know. Let's go see, as they suggested, let's go see the internet and see what they have to tell us. So um, half life of TC99M, right? And so we'll go see what that is. Techni Technetium, 99M, blah, 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 blah. Let's go here and just go half-life, 6.067 hours. So I was closer with the 6 than I was with the 5.5. Now let's go back to part B. <clears throat> part, I'm sorry, that was part B. Oh, that was part A. Part B is create an exponential function for the amount of radioactivity of TC99M remaining where T equals number of half-life intervals. So then part B, that was A, part B is, all that for now, the complexity is going to be very simple. We're talking about half-life, so my decay factor is one half. T, and I'm going to start out with 50, and this is Y or Q or whatever is Q for quantity, I think is what they're trying to do, but where we need to specify that T is equal to six hour periods. T is equal to one comma six hour time period, okay? And then part C, part C is asking what fraction of radioactivity of TC, TC99M remain after one day? So that means we have to say one day is equal to how many six, how many six hour periods? So we have to sort of convert it, right? So in one day, that's 24 hours. How many six hour periods is that? So I'm gonna divide it by six hours. I'm gonna get four uh, periods, right? Four half-life periods. So once I know that, I can put it in my original, my formula that I made up here and say Y or Q or whatever is equal to 50 times one half times, uh, raised to the four for uh, half-life periods. And so 50 over 1 over, so what is that? 2 to the 4th is six, 1 16th. So that's 50 over 16, uh, whatever that is. I suppose I can jam it in the calculator right here, right? It just makes the video longer, though, so I apologize to some extent. 50 divided by 16 because you're all able, capable of jamming it in your calculator. So 3.125, 3.125 MBQs. So let's see what the answers we get. Um, on the graph, the initial radioactivity, blah, 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 and they say 6.01. So there, since they use 6.01, we might be off a little bit with our answer in C. Uh, B, we get the same model that they do, and we have to specify that T is equal to a six hour period. And then part C, they get uh, 1 16th of the original for, so 1 16th of the original, but we took 50, div 50, 50 and divided by 1 16th, and so we get the actual amount is 3.125. Did they say, oh, what fraction? So it would have been 1 16th, since they were saying, don't worry about how much you started out with. So 1 16th is the correct answer. Okay. Example six, we're almost done here. Example six, and I think I'm going to be a little bit more efficient than the last one, but we'll see. Representing caffeine levels with equivalent equations. When you drink an eight ounce cup of coffee, virtually all the caffeine is absorbed in your gut 
and passes through the liver and into your bloodstream, acting as a stimulant. A peak blood level of caffeine, 120 milligrams, is reached in about 30 minutes, and then the blood level begins to fall exponentially. Five hours after the peak, your blood contains 60 milligrams of caffeine. So if I started out with 120 milligrams, in 30 minutes, I get to 120 milligrams, right? A peak is reached over 30 minutes. So it takes me 30 minutes and I'm at 120 milligrams. And then the blood levels begin to fall exponentially, so exponential decay. And I'm at 60 milligrams after five hours. So what is the half-life of caffeine in your bloodstream from peak? You should hit pause if you don't know what that is and think about it. And if you're ready, let's play again. But if you've already figured it out, you can just keep playing. It's five hours, right? Because if I start out with 120 milligrams and I'm down to 60 after five hours, and it takes five hours for my bloodstream, uh, for, for the half-life of the caffeine in my bloodstream, right? Okay. So part A, example six, part A, is construct a function to model the caffeine decrease in your bloodstream over time. So we can do the same thing we've been doing. I'm not sure exactly if it's what they're asking. So we're gonna say C is the initial amount of caffeine because who knows how much we're gonna have. That's not an initial amount, that's my peak amount. So C equals peak amount of caffeine. Do I know how to spell caffeine? Probably not, so just make a bunch of squiggles. Uh, I spelled it right. Um, caffeine in the bloodstream. Since we're talking about decay and we're talking about half-life, maybe, we'll see, we'll do it that way and we'll, we'll define T to be uh, number of five-hour periods, okay? Now that's part A, oh, I already put it there. Part B is Find an equivalent equation to model the decay of caffeine using A equals growth factor. Is we want to represent A as a growth factor. And so previously I said we're not going to overly complicate the base for now, and this is where we're going to start doing that, at the back end of the second section. So I don't want A to be one half. Okay, I want A to represent um, the actual growth factor and such that I can just enter time in for T instead of having, like what if, what if it was seven hours later? Well, seven isn't exactly how many five, five hour periods have gone by, but I wanna know how much caffeine is in my bloodstream. So we wanna convert this one half into, um, into a number that's not one half so that we can put time into T. So right now, T is equal to five hours or the number of five hour time periods. I guess I don't want to represent it that way. Um, and so a way to think about it is I want A to be whatever it's gonna be. It's gonna be some other number than one half. But I want five to be equal to one half to the one. Because remember this is representing the half life of caffeine at peak for one time period which is equivalent to five hours. It's equivalent to five hours, but I don't know what this number would be. Is it 0.7, is it 0.2, I have no idea, okay? So I'm gonna use this little equation to sort out what this A is. Because look, I have an equation, I have a relationship that's true, I wanna make this equal to that and change my value for A so that they are equal. And so what do I have to do? now? You may or may not be familiar with this math. We've done it in class previously. So we're gonna do this again. Uh, let me change colors. So to get rid of this five and solve for A, I have to raise this to the one fifth, remember? And so if I raise one half to the one, oops, to the one fifth, right? If I raise it to the one fifth, this equals one, so I'm just left with A, and then one half to the one fifth in my calculator looks like this. 0.5, yeah, it's not like that, 0.5 raised to the one fifth. So I think I can just do this on this calculator. Be careful if you have an old style calculator, you have to put parentheses around that. And so I get 0 0.87055. So A is equal to 0 0.87. 055, that's a seven, not a triangle, okay? It's because I paused my 
Apple Pencil. Okay? And so my equation looks like this. Did they just ask for the growth factor or they asked for the equation? I don't know remember which one. Find an equivalent equation model that the A is the growth factor. So it's going to be some starting amount times 0 0.87055. Did I round that nicely or not so much nicely? Yeah, I did it okay. Um, raised to the t, and then in this case, t is equal to hours after, it's doing that thing again, because I paused, hours after peak caffeine. Okay? And C, generate a sketch of the caffeine levels in your bloodstream over time where time is measured in hours. I'm perfectly fine you either taking your calculator and jam it in there and sketching it, or of course, we can just desmos it up. Hopefully at this point in time, you've learned how to uh, grab screen captures of from Desmos or whatnot. Um, you could do that on your phone as well. Your phone has, you can download Desmos Scientific Calculator and Desmos Graphing Calculator. They're both free and the best calculators you can get, I believe, for your phone at zero cost. So I'm gonna have C, but I'm just gonna put one in there. So in other words, I don't have to put C in at all, correct? Um, and I'm going to put um, 0 0.87055 raised to the X, or T, it doesn't matter. And now I'm going to zoom out and see this decay. So remember, I, I not remember. Yeah, well, actually, from the other video, I had some crazy numbers in here. So let's take a look at this a little bit better. Um, let's go from negative uh, 10 to 10. Let's just go square for now. Let's go uh, negative 10 to 10 and see what's happening here. And that looks a little better. And that means I want to shrink this down because we're talking about really small amounts at this point, right? Oh, it's because I started out with one. So if I start out with 120, Uh, it'll just change the scale, right? So I can do this and it'll look a little better. Yeah, instead of starting out with one milligram and going down to decimals, I can put, start out with 120 and just look at it this way. So you could take a screenshot of that and throw it into your, if, if you're asked to do same as homework. So far, the I haven't put any written homework in because I want to talk to you guys about that, all right? Uh, da, 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 da. I think I might. Anyway, C, generated, okay, so here we go. There's a model that we wrote up, right? It's down here. C, one half. T, 120, 120 is our starting amount, and we defined what T represents, number of five-hour intervals. I say time periods, either or. Uh, we got the same answer they got here for our A, and they've used the same methodology that I've demonstrated to you, remember, to, un to undo, or, uh, undo this exponent of five, I can raise it to the one-half. And then using the growth factor, and they're putting in the 120, so that's what I did once I finally graphed it and said it was thought it was hard to, to view in the graph. We need to put some starting amounts so it's a little easier. Just use the one they've been given us and I'm use little t here. Now note they're distinct making a distinction between capital T and lowercase t because this is the same problem. Okay? And then there's our graph and our graph looks like this as well. Okay? Did they ask us to mark off the half? Where time is measured in hours? No. So this whole half thing, they didn't ask us to do that, so we didn't. And that's it for the section. And hopefully I did this less than 30 minutes, but um, I trimmed the other one down to 30. Uh, and let's see if I can do the same for this one. Thanks much.